I believe the world is beginning to experience these awakenings, a love awakening, grace awakening, joy awakening, peace awakening, you know, a true God awakening to the fact of who God really is. And we are part of that awakening to help people discover the truth as we discover the truth and begin to share that truth and live that truth. So it's important that we embrace these awakenings. And as we embrace them, we can begin to share them. Now, this is a new series, um, so Restoring First Love. So we're building on the foundation of unconditional love in this new series. I'm going to share the journey that led to the restoration of my first love relationship with the Father and the discovery of my own identity as a son of God that as was a result of that. Um, who are you? That's a question that God had been asking me for a long time. He asked me in various ways over a period of time. To begin with, my answers were always works based associated with what I was doing. Uh, and a lot of us sort of identify ourselves by what we do rather than who we are. Uh, my soul defined my identity, but God was seeking to reveal the true me. But my soul needed to accept that. And that wasn't an easy process by any means. And all of us go through a process and different ways that God begins to reveal a, who we really are, but B, what hinders us accepting that reality. Uh, and there may be many things in each of us that God has to deal with. Each of our souls has created an identity for ourselves using the data collected during our lives. The things that have happened to us, the information that we receive, the programming that we've received by culture, religion, family. All of us have had a programming of some sort information has been flowing through our senses from the outside that has created the need for our soul to survive to cope protect itself from the harsh realities of the life we often live um, the soul's defense mechanisms are in fact prisons that the soul uses to falsely keep us safe these prisons stop us knowing the true reality of who we really are and until the soul surrenders control and when we do that, that enables us to trust God for his protection, provision, direction, um, rather than having to do it for ourselves. And it's really hard when you've had to do it yourself to let go of control and allow God to be God. Mm -hmm. And trusting him is not a, a simple thing. It may sound simple. Well, I trust God. And I would have said implicitly that I trusted God until he challenged what that really meant and what trust really was in my relationship with him. So who am I? That's a question that's the core of most people's psyche. I want to, to picture a, a scene. Imagine you're in a boat. You're adrift on a vast ocean. You don't know where you are. You don't know that actually this is an ocean of unconditional love. You've got no sails and no oars. And this is the sort of hopeless position that mankind is seemingly in, not realizing that where they actually are and protecting themselves from where they actually are. And this state of despair is a deception. It's an illusion. It's a delusion that falls mankind into trying to navigate on the surface of the ocean of love by self-effort. Now, the answer is to get out of the boat and to sink into the depths of unconditional love to find out who we really are, to find out who God really is. You know, we're never separated from God as we exist within him. Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live, live and move and exist. Everything, in fact, exists within God, who's created a place within himself for relationship. Separation is therefore an illusion we've created because of our guilt and shame. And that has kept us from intimacy with God and kept us in lost identity. So getting out of the safety of the boat seems counterintuitive to the natural mind because our natural mind has been conditioned by following the DIY tree independent path. So the question is, who are you? And how are you gonna find out who you are? I would suggest you're never gonna find out. You won't know who you are if you stay in the boat. And for a lot of us, that boat, even though we don't know where we are and we don't know where we're going and we can't really get there 
Uh, and whatever we're doing, if we're paddling by our hands, it's a lot of effort. But the reality is it will never give us the truth if we stay in that position of doing it ourselves. So the question, who do you think you are? And if you'd asked me that 10 years ago, I will give you one answer. If you asked me five years ago, I'd probably give you a different answer. Today, I'll give you another answer. 30 years ago, I'd have given you a completely different answer. So who do you think you are? Who do others think you are? And that's a, an important question because often what other people think can define us if we allow it. Are you defined by other people's opinions of you or by your own life circumstances? Are you defined and shaped by your past experiences? Now, the, the answer is yes. Yeah, we can't help that, but we don't have to stay there. Are you who your parents say you are? Are you who your friends say you are? Are you who your boss says you are? Are you who your genetics say you are? The real question is, who does love say you are? Get out of the boat, sink in the vast ocean of love and surrender and be immersed and saturated in unconditional love. Have a return to first love. That will reveal who we really are. God as love defines us. He defines who you are. So who are you? I would suggest you can only really know through a restored face-to-face -face love relationship with God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. And that love relationship is what we all need to discover the truth and to experience the truth. So this whole series, and, you know, I don't know how many sessions there's going to be, um, probably more than I think at the moment. Um, and depending on how God leads me in it, it's going to be about first love and it's intended to help all of us discover who we really are and to go deeper into that relationship and to find that place of peace and rest within trust in God. Now, all of us and you and I'm speaking to each person who's listening to this now, each person who's going to listen to it. You are a child of God. You're the apple of God's eye the treasure of God's heart and the object of his desire. Now, if I say that to some people, they would really struggle to actually believe that is true because of the way they've been taught, probably through religion or through their own relationship upbringing to how they think about themselves and how they think about God. And for some people, it's really hard for them to accept how they are loved by God unconditionally and the way God does think about them. To know the truth, we need to stop trying to set our own course or row the boat, even if we've got no oars or paddles, we'll try and make something to do it and jump into that vast ocean of love and be consumed by unconditional love. Because what it will consume, it will be everything that hinders us discovering the truth of who God is and who we are. So who are you? Now, I would encourage you to go on this journey to discover who you are as you journey through the garden of your heart towards intimacy. And this was the path that I took. Um, now, all of us will have different ways of engaging this path. But I started when I first started to engage God in a more intimate way, in a more sort of supernatural way, you could say. When I first started to engage heaven, that also paralleled within what was happening within me when I was discovering that I did have a garden of my heart. I didn't know I had one. Um, I, you can find lots of illustrations of that in the Bible, but God began to show me this garden. And that was the beginning of this relationship that took me into a greater intimacy with God himself. Then you can step on the dance floor of discovery then enter the soaking room of transformation to eventually engage with the bridal chamber for the consummation of first love when we really begin to discover in a much, much deeper way, a heart-to-heart, face-to-face yeah. experience of true reality. So restoring first love will restore our true identity. It will restore our origin and our sonship relationship and position. And this is really where first love for me is found. 
where we began, our true origin. That will enable us to find a restoring of our inheritance and our authority as sons of God and co-heirs of creation. And there's a, a huge area for us to discover about creation and our role in creation as God always intended it to be. And we're rediscovering that um, as we begin to identify as sons. And it's really important that we embrace that reality. Restoring first love will re restore our creative power and our position within the order of Melchizedek. That order is restoring our identity as priests, kings, oracles, legislators. That is a governmental function of relationship with God, restoring our destiny, our true creational purpose as sons. And our sonship will reflect our father because that's the important thing. We're not there to be independent. We're there to be a reflection of our heavenly father as his sons. So unconditional love is to be experienced, not just intellectually believed or understood. Now, I hope having done 23 sessions, people are moving beyond just believing that God is unconditional love and he unconditionally loves us to understand it by personal experience. We're all invited to go beyond the intellectual and the theoretical knowledge to the experiential truth. And true knowledge is experiential. It was never supposed to be information, but experience which would ground that in reality in our lives. We call it testimony. The power of testimony is really strong because it is something that we have actually experienced and can testify to. And the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit of who we really are and enables us to begin to grasp the truth of that reality in a much, much deeper way. Now, one, Ephesians 1, 4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, this was something God did because God has been proactive in predestining us to a restored, intimate, face-to-face -face relationship with him. He didn't wait for us to suddenly think we need to have our relationship with God restored. He was proactively working. He already had set this into uh, going forth right from the beginning uh, in his heart. And the Mirror Bible says he associated us in Christ before the fall of the world. Jesus is God's mind made up about us. He always knew in his love that he would present us again face to face before him in blameless innocence. And that is the state that we need to come back to, to be in a state of first love and to fully embrace how God felt about us and how God engaged us before we ever came here into this physical realm. So God is not passive. He's very proactive and he's proactive and actively seeking us out to restore us to first love. He's not sitting around waiting for us. He is acting. Now, of course, he wants us to experience that and he wants us to go forward with that. But it's his reaching out to us, which is the important aspect. And the first love was established within God's heart within God's mind before the fall of the world to ensure our relationship with him would be eternal. There can be a s illusion of separation from our part until we rediscover that relationship. But from God's part, it's never changed. So the journey to discover first love is about God wooing us back into an intimate relationship with him. So marriage and the union um, that marriage represents is the model that God has used to illustrate this first love relationship and help us experience it. Now, we're not talking obviously about physical marriage, but we're talking about from God's perspective, what marriage really is and what a union of relationship really is. So we can begin to uh, experience that God desired marriage with mankind and chose Israel later after adam 
chose independence. God chose Abraham and through Abraham eventually came Israel and to Israel, they were forerunners of that relationship. Now, Jesus is the seed of Abraham and he has brought us into a relationship of marriage, of relationship, which is a completely different dimension to what was offered in the beginning to them in the wilderness and beyond because there's a different level to this now because of the nature of what Jesus came to do in the spirit to reveal the true nature of God and to open up that relationship where we could be with God in God and God in us when they refused the invitation um, that didn't stop God using marriage as the metaphor to help us understand the process to restore us to first love. And I will share some of my journey with that and some of the stories and some of the experiences I had along the way, which helped me come to a deeper level of relationship. So this process is metaphorical, it's spiritual, it's not a literal marriage, although there is a physical element to it. We will each have unique individual experiences and journeys. Each of us will navigate that journey ourselves and God will treat us individually because we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. And there's none of us which is exactly the same, but God's love for us is the same. So when I share my journey, it's to encourage you to have your own journey and to find that experience. So marriage is a union, becoming one flesh, a union of spirit, soul, body with God. We are becoming one spirit with one who actually dwells within us. This isn't an external relationship. It's an internal experience. So 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So embracing first love is, is the joining ourselves to god and experiencing that at a spiritual level that will affect our soul and body the depth of relationship in corinthians is equated to a physical union 1 corinthians 6 16 the previous verse says or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her for he says the two shall become one flesh now, obviously, God is not wanting us to engage in some sort of sexual relationship, but he's using it as an illustration about how deep that relationship is. So the union of first love contains a physical, not a sexual component. And it is illustrated to us in John's version of this reality. And John shared in John 14 the, what was going to happen when Jesus went to prepare this relationship. So John 14, verse 2, and this passage uh, is often misunderstood, misinterpreted, and put to a future experience rather than a present one. It says, in my father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And the problem is that people interpret of where I am as, well, this must mean that Jesus is in heaven that he's going to heaven he's going to build a house for us there he's coming back and he's going to take us to go with him in heaven now that understanding is a complete wrong understanding of this passage because this passage actually is a marriage passage when they had a marriage they would have a process and there would be a question asked of the bride to the groom and the groom would speak and say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In other words, I'm going to build you a house where we can live together and dwell together in union. And the, the woman would say to the man, well, when are you coming? You know, when are you going to come for me? And there was this expectation because in that culture, they would go and usually build an addition to the father's house. 
and the son would live in the father's house in this annex, if you like, or this sort of additional thing that was built on. So when Jesus was here talking, he was not talking about a heaven or physical rooms and houses. He was talking about the place where he could dwell. And I am the statement of I am. Of course, God called himself. I am that I am is the important factor in this passage. And if we read the passage onwards, we'll actually discover that John understood probably by cardiogenosis, probably because of the heart to heart experiences he had with Jesus, what Jesus was really referring to. And he described that. So Jesus went to the cross. That was where Jesus was going to go. And he went to the cross to prepare us to be his dwelling place or home. And you could say, yes, there's a corporate sense where the church is God's home, but there's individually the church is made up of living stones. Therefore, we're all part of that dwelling and we're all a personal dwelling place. So I am is a union of relationship, not a physical or spiritual location. I am is a description of the relationship that Jesus had with the father. And that is borne out in John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? So here's the statement. So when in the first few verses, he said that where I am, you may be also. He was referring to this relationship. I am in the father. And the father is in me. And that is the union that he was basically declaring that he was going to go to prepare them to have and to be that dwelling place. The re that whole uh, perspective was a relationship which was intended to be a present state of reality. But religion has put it off to the future. In other words, religion makes I am a place in heaven where we can only go after we die. Where I am is a statement describing a relationship of being in union, not a location in heaven someday in the future, but a present relationship, which we have now. And in actual fact, Jesus said how this would soon take place. So Jesus came back from the dead from the cross from the resurrection and in resurrection power he promised to reveal the union of i am and in john 14 20 it says on that day and that was resurrection day which actually jesus came and visited them on resurrection day breathed into them and said receive the spirit that union that being born from above that relationship was established in them at that point and for the whole of mankind although the rest of mankind didn't recognize that because they did not have the relationship with jesus and knew the promise that they the disciples had but the fact is that god now dwells within all mankind but most don't know it yet and it is unveiling that relationship that gives us this good news message to say that God loves each person and dwells within looking to reveal himself to enable them to know the truth of who they are. So intimacy with God is beyond and deeper than sexual union. It is the knowledge of the heart, cardiogenosis, that knowledge, that intimacy reveals. And on my journey, I had many experiences that revealed that knowledge. It wasn't intellectual knowledge. It wasn't that Jesus was saying to me or the father was saying something that went into my head. It was knowledge or truth that was imparted into my heart, often through the intimacy of a hug, through a heart to heart engagement. And, you know, you can hug someone and be heart to heart or hug someone and be opposite heart to heart by the way in which you hug people. And a lot of people hug people in a way which keeps their hearts apart. We need to embrace God as father and allow him to reveal the truth of that relationship. 
so we would know who God is by experience. And I remember one time during this journey where I was getting caught up in doing things for God because it was a thrill and it was amazing to discover what I could do in the realms of heaven or what I could do in the courts of heaven and what I was learning from God about my sonship position and my governmental position in sonship. It was amazing. But that was becoming my focus rather than the relationship. And so one day I engaged with God in intimacy as I did every day. There was a hug and I started to ask the father, well, what are we doing today? And there was nothing vocal that came back. Just he hugged me close and wouldn't let me go. He didn't say anything. But there was an infusion of knowledge of the truth of the father and that resonance with his frequency that I learned more about the fragrance and intimacy with God as father during that hug than anything else during my experience with God. Because he infused it into my heart by stopping me getting on to the works based mentality of it all now when we're talking about relationship union we're not talking about gender there is no male or female in the kingdom and sonship is neither male or female so it's referring to both sons and daughters so we're not talking here about a marriage in the sense of a male and a female we're talking about first love being the restoration of our relationship identity as sons and daughters. So there's no need for gender identity within that. Now, I'm not saying you should ignore the fact that you are a male or female physically here. But when it comes to spiritual and the spiritual nature of our identity, God is not looking at those characteristics. He's looking at who we really are. We're all made in his image and likeness. Because God has both male and female characteristics anyway. So we're not looking at the male, female, and therefore what is marriage between a male or female. That's not what we're looking at when we're looking at this relationship of union. We're looking at a union in the spirit. So first love restores our true identity in a union of spirit, soul, body with father, son, and spirit within the core of our innermost being. That process leads to the consummation, that deepening of the relationship, when we've got to a point where we've accepted the invitation of God's love and the fact that he loves us and wants relationship at that level, we have begun to understand and be uh, encouraged with our destiny and our identity as sons and daughters and for that then to take us through the process of transformation that would be needed to enable us to come to that deep relationship and to engage God actually face to face so the whole journey that I went on through that process of the garden and the and the dance floor and the soaking room and the and the bridal chamber took me to face-to-face -to -face relationship with the father even at that moment i could not contain that experience for long it was too overwhelming for me even though i'd gone through that journey because there was still more to happen in my life but that first experience as as a small as it was opened the door for future experiences until over the last number of years I, I have dwelt in the presence of God face to face, in the presence of God, person to person with God, heart to heart, mind to mind, eye to eye, spirit to spirit, if you like, in that place of intimacy that I couldn't have even imagined that at the beginning, the first time I looked at God face to face, I was afraid <laughs> because I was told if you look into God's eyes, you know, you might never come back. And in reality, I can understand something of that because the multifaceted nature and manifold nature of God was just 
overwhelming to my senses, to my soul. But the more I embraced the intimacy and relationship, the more I was able to dwell and stay face to face, heart to heart. And that relationship just deepened and deepened. So I was able to stay there longer and longer and longer until it became my dwelling place. Just like God dwells in me, and I've learned to understand and experience God dwelling in me in that union, in that relationship within the very core of my being. I also learned to dwell with God in the realm of perfection, in the light of his presence, in a way that I could never have even imagined or thought in the beginning. But I experienced it. Slowly, the relationship deepened, the intimacy deepened, the knowledge that I had of who God is, particularly, obviously, in unconditional love, in rest, in love and joy and peace, in living loved and loving living and living loving that whole process that whole journey to bring me to that state of reality you know took 10 12 years of my life but it was you know a process that i had to go through because i couldn't jump from where i was to where i am without having gone through the experiences that i've gone through that eventually bring you to being able to see yourself in a non-linear multi-dimensional way that you're not limited by time, space or material things, that there's so much more for us to discover about who we really are. So the process leads to the consummation is the reestablishing of first love. And the process is like a courtship or a betrothal. It is it is going deeper and deeper and deeper until you are able to come to a point of consummation where the soul, spirit and body are in union with god so as individuals and as humanity as a whole all we like sheep have gone astray following our own path of independence but god proactively came to seek and to save that which was lost the good shepherd sought out the lost sheep and still does he is continually seeking those who are living in lost identity and a lot of christians are still living in lost identity even though they have a relationship with God at a certain level. Whatever level of relationship we have, God wants to take it deeper. He doesn't want us to remain in the same place. So mankind may have turned away from God to live in that lost identity of independence, but God never turned away from us. God as Father always saw us, his children, through the lens of love and desired that all would return to our first love origin and that is the key and you know there are a number of bible verses that really speak about this love and the depth of it romans 8 38 for instance for i am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing including ourselves, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that's quite a statement, but that statement is based in God and not us. It's not based in our ability to maintain a certain standard. It is purely a statement of God's grace and mercy and love. And in the Mirror Bible, it says, this is my conviction. No threat whether it be in death or life, be it angelic beings, demon powers or political principalities, nothing known to us at this time or even in the unknown future, no dimension of any calculation in time or space nor any device yet to be invented has what it takes to separate us from the love of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus is our ultimate authority. Go back from that uh, passage and there are a number of things that lead up to that passage, which are talking about the relationship. So go back to Romans 8, 14. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. So as we come into a union, as we're joined to God, not separated from him in our own understanding, but joined to him, we become one spirit. Therefore, we are being led by the spirit. 
who with our spirit enables our spirit to mature to grow and to develop into who we are always intended to be and to discover who we were before we came here for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but how many people became christians and then through the church and through religion ended up fearing again and ended up in works of appeasement of an angry god when god is a loving god and this wants us to know the truth that we're sons and daughters but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out abba father now of course they could never cry out abba father in the old testament in the old covenant this was a new covenant statement that jesus came to reveal that this was his relationship with his father so it could be our relationship with him and our father verse 16 it says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of god and this is what happens in this union there is a testifying with our deep understanding of our who we are in the spirit and who we really are that we are children of god that we've always been children of god that we will never ever not be children of god and if children and we are children this isn't a statement of well are you this is a in, indicative thing that says you are therefore as children your heirs also heirs of what heirs of god and fellow heirs with christ or co-heirs with christ in the whole of creation now this is where um the way this is now written may challenge some people because it says if now again this is not if as if we have to do something this is a statement that says something has already taken place so in english in this verse it says if indeed we suffer with him so we may also be glorified with him and it's almost like that oh well we've got suffering to do in this life now what it's saying is we identify with his sufferings because he went through those sufferings for us so we wouldn't have to go through it other than identifying with him so if we go back again and read those verses now in the mirror bible it says romans 8 14 the original life of the father revealed in his son is the life the spirit now conducts within us so the spirit is now looking with the father and the son to reveal our original origin and identity the original life that he intended us to have as children of god in relationship slavery is such a poor substitute for sonship they are opposites the one leads to forcibly through fear while sonship responds fondly to abba father and what god is looking to do is for us to engage abba father daddy with that no fear just wonderful wonderful peace and rest verse 16 his spirit resonates within our spirit to confirm the fact that we originate in god and this is what he is looking to do in this process to show us our origin to show us who we really are from the beginning so that who we are now will be in alignment with who we were in the beginning not as a product of our lives up to this point because we are his offspring we qualify to be heirs this is not something that is earned this is purely by grace because we are his offspring his children we qualify to be heirs god himself is our portion we co-inherit with christ since we were represented and included in his suffering now this is very different than us going through suffering we were already included in his suffering we equally participate in the glory of his resurrection this isn't something that happens in glory as they used to call heaven this is something that can happen now 
because as he's been resurrected, so also we died with him, we are now alive with him to fully embrace the glory of that resurrection power that reveals who we really are. Now, you could say who we really are is our glory. It's our true identity, the clothing of that glorious nature that we have as children of God. So what is love? Now, if we're talking about first love, we obviously have to think, what is love? What is different about first love from love? Why is first love so important? And obviously we'll look to cover some of these things. Our eternal destiny is established on the restoration of our first love experience with our Heavenly Father. We're never going to fulfill who we really are if we don't know who we really are. So it's absolutely important that we find our true origin and our true identity. Now, first love in context here is not the state or feelings we had when we first discovered our salvation, because some people may have had a very emotional salvation experience or realization. I had none. I had no emotions or feelings that went with me praying a prayer and asking Jesus to come into my life. Why? Because of who I was at that point and my own relationship with my own father and my own experiences in life, even though I was only 12 at the time, but that still shaped and programmed me. So I prayed the prayer, believing that what I did was what I was supposed to do, but there was no emotion, there were no feelings, there was no any ecstasy or anything like that now subsequently during my life i have had many ecstatic experiences that have enabled me to have uh, feelings and experiences which are actually about love so i know that i am loved but then i just prayed a prayer now you may have had a dramatic salvation realization that was very emotional but what i'm talking about in first love is not really saying well i want to go back to what i had then now those emotions may be great and i'm not saying that we shouldn't have emotions like that at all but that's not really what i want to really talk about as first love means so first love is our origin in god before we ever came to live in this body on earth First love is our eternal identity originating in perichoresis, in the circle of relationship that Father, Son, Spirit have. Now, Revelation 4.2, which is the verse in the Bible that talks about first love, says this, and this was speaking to the Ephesian church, but this I have against you that you've left your first love. Now, we also may have left our first earthly love relationship with God. We may have had an emotional, amazing experience where we realize God's amazing grace and mercy in love and saving us from a, in a dramatic way from our life as it was. But most of us who have got involved in religion in any way have succumbed to the religious trap of works, duty, obligation, just as the Ephesian church did. So that that sort of amazing experience they first have was no longer how they were living. The Ephesian church abandoned the love they once had for God. That relationship was no longer their priority. Duty became their focus rather than intimacy. They were no longer in love with God, but started working for him. It was part of the family business, if you like. Um, now, that is not how God intends us to be. And whatever our initial experience of god god wants to take that beyond into true reality of what it is and then hopefully we will never leave it because it is not just emotions but there is a whole depth of relationship that goes with it now i wonder do you remember your own first love felt with god when you became a christian or when you realized what salvation was do you remember it was it dramatic? 
was there a depth of emotions involved with it and it felt like this was a whole new life and it was amazing what was your first love relationship with another person because as part of this series I also want to look at how God can restore first love with a person because God wants us to have a depth of passion with a person we're in love with or we're in relationship or we're married to. So for me, through my upbringing and through my, my own insecurities, you know, I never really had that first love experience because it was warped by my understanding of love or my emotional needs or my physical needs and the hormones that were racing through me as a teenager. So I felt somewhat cheated of what that really was supposed to be or could be. Now, God restored that for me, and I believe he can restore it for anybody. And when we have that experience with God and with someone else, there are emotions of passion, maybe an overwhelming desire, being smitten, you know, our minds captivated, thinking of the next glimpse or meeting. Was your salvation experience with God an encounter with first love? Because mine wasn't. So God took me into something I'd never experienced in the first place at a level that I'd never even thought possible. And therefore, there are a lot of words which are associated with how someone feels when they first fall in love. Besotted with, infatuated with, enamored of, love struck smitten with passionate about um, with a passion for consumed with desire for captivated by enthralled by entranced by devoted to doting on mad crazy nuts wild potty about bowled over by carrying a torch for twitter pated by um we're in springtime i was reminded of bambi and the twitter patient that takes place in the natural realm this time of year and looking out in the garden we can see the birds and they're all beginning to pair up and um, start nesting and there's a sense where there's something new about spring there's something new life after winter begins if you live in a part of the world that has four seasons of course but you know i never had those ex those real feelings towards god i never felt god had those feelings towards me and i never really had that towards someone else until God took me on this process of restoring my own first love relationship with him that enabled me then to realize that I could also have a first love relationship with somebody else. So first love, let's focus on the meaning of first. Because if it's first love, what does first mean? Well, coming before all others in time or order. So this is something we had before anything else that we could say was an experience in life paramount top topmost uttermost utmost prime chief leading main major now those all put priority on that sort of love it's first it is above every other type of love foremost principal highest greatest preeminent overriding outstanding supreme premier predominant, prevailing, most important, of greatest importance, of prime importance, vital, key, essential, crucial, central, core, focal, pivotal, pivotal, dominant, ruling. Now, those sort of things, it's like when I read all that, I think, wow, I hadn't, could never even anticipate that type of love. But that is the love that I've experienced that God has for me that's enabled me to have that type of love for him and for others. So it's first before everything. That is before me, before my family, my relationships, my work, my leisure, my needs, before worry, concern, anxiety, fear, depression, despair. No matter what it is we have in life, this is before all that, both in measure but also in time, that anything we've gone through in our life, this can take us back to a place that can then affect the outworking and healing and restoring of everything that's gone on in our life. 
So we're not then subject to what's happened in the past and just stuck because we may have had a terrible upbringing or we may have had terrible parents or we may have had broken relationships or any of those things. Those things which do impact our soul because our spirit can go back to its origin can actually bring healing and wholeness to every area of our whole spirit, soul and body. So if the priority of my life is first love with God, everything else will flow from that relationship in my life. Now, Luke 14, 33, Jesus was talking. He says, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Now, he wasn't talking about giving away everything to the poor or anything like that. He did challenge someone to do that who was caught up with riches and that person struggled to do that or even think about it or contemplate it. He was talking here about actually the things that are pre predominant or matter in our lives and the priority they have on us. So if our relationship with God is our priority above everything else, then those earthly possessions, they just pale into comparison. Earthly relationships pale into comparison, but are enhanced by our relationship with our father and therefore should be stronger for that relationship with our father as it enables us to reciprocate that with others so what is love what do we mean when we use the word love what do we think and feel when we hear the word love the answer to those questions will have been influenced and affected by our personal experiences for some you hear the word love and it's a, a really hard thing to hear because you may have been affected by broken relationships and promises of love which never came to fruition. John, who I believe experienced a depth of love, hence when he wrote John 14, he was expressing something there of his own personal experience and what Jesus was revealing to him. John also wrote in 1 John 4, 16, we have come to know, and that means by personal experience, and have believed so when you have personal experience, you do believe. It is not that you believe and then that gives you the experience. The experience gives you belief. That is why faith is not based in what we experience by the realization of what is already true. Therefore, we don't have to have faith. God has faith in us or God imparts his faith to us. So as we experience it, we will inevitably believe it. Unless we have a real problem with trust and we're suspicious, you know, and that does happen. You know, I've seen miracles happen. I've seen miracles performed as I prayed for people and people have watched and observed amazing things, people's legs growing and things like that. And then they're, they're skeptical of whether, well, did they really see that? Was that really true? Did it really happen? And they were there watching it. But they didn't have the experience. I guarantee that the person who had their leg grow and therefore were not sort of lopsided in their walk and had a problem with their back and everything else that that caused, I guarantee that they did not have a problem believing that they were healed because they experienced it themselves. So this verse in John 14, from John 1 John 4, 16, we have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. And that is the key to restoring first love, is the love that God has for us from the beginning that we knew in the beginning. So God is love. And the one who abides in love, now again, abiding means dwelling, living, abides in God. So when we're abiding in this love relationship, we're abiding in God and God abides in him. Now, this is a way that God described or, and John described what Jesus said in John 14. This relationship with love brings about an abiding where we live in love and therefore we live in God and God lives in us. Now, we know John 3.16 as a verse is the, probably one of the most famous verses that there are. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish or actually be lost is a better translation because the word perish means loss, but have eternal life. So God so loved everyone and everything that he gave because he was totally committed to the restoration of us to that love so that we could have the eternal life, which was a return to the origin of life, the eternal nature of that origin. And that is what this means. Just doesn't mean sort of, well, we'll go to heaven one day when we die. This means return to the true origin of what life was intended to be with God. So love is one word in the English language with many different meanings. Love has many words in other languages that differentiates its meaning. And Greek and Hebrew are those languages have different words for love. And so do other languages. But I was brought up with English. So love is one word. So I could say to someone, I love you. Or I could say, I love ice cream. I do love ice cream. But does that carry the same weight as me saying I love somebody to loving ice cream? No, but the words are the same. So the context gives you an idea. They're very different concepts of loving someone and loving ice cream. But we use the same word and therefore that can be misunderstood. So Hebrew words for love, ahab, spontaneous, impulsive love, hesed, deliberate choice of affection, kindness, covenant love, raham, to have compassion, brotherly love. So there are three different ones there, and there may be others, but those are three which are different words to express something that in English we only have one word. Therefore, the Greek words for love, eros, erotic love, this word is not actually found in the New Testament, but obviously is found in Greek literature. Philio, storge, and agape, three other words which are found in the New Testament that have specific meanings. Filio love, which means to have a special interest in someone or something frequently with a focus on close association, affection for, like considering someone a friend, it refers to a strong liking or a strong friendship. We love things that we strongly like. So I do like ice cream. Therefore, I could say I love ice cream in that context, but I'm not in love with ice cream. I love my car. I love the way your hair looks. I mean, there are things we use in the English language which don't always really convey the correct meaning or the depth of meaning that love really is intended to have. So the Greek word storge, the love and affection that naturally occurs between parents and children, can exist between siblings and exist between husbands and wives in a good marriage. Now you can have storge love in a marriage, but if you add agape love to that marriage, then that marriage is going to go up a whole different level. So Romans 10, 12 talks about philo storgos. That encourages us to be loving and kind to each other. So there's an outworking of that brotherly love and deep our love. But then there's a Greek word agape, which was seldom used in Greek literature. It is used in the Bible a lot because it refers to the love of God. One of the kinds of love God has for us. And we are to have for God and people. Now, you can agape love your enemies, but you can't filio love them. And that is because of the very nature of the word. Because that love is not motivated by feelings or emotions. Agape is the very nature of God, who is love. So what we read, agape love is known by the action it prompts towards others. Agape love motivates to positive action. It is not just doing things because of how it feels or because we feel obliged or obligated or it's a duty. Well, we need to love people and I should love, you know, no, actually agape love is the motivation, the empowerment to love. But you have to receive it to be able to express it. Agape love is therefore not simply an impulse generated from feelings. Agape love is an exercise of the will, a deliberate choice. That is why God can encourage us to love our enemies, because we can make a choice not based on whether our enemies deserve it 
or whether we're angry with them or anything else, but because we can choose to do what God has done to us in loving us that way. So he's not commanding us to have a good feeling for our enemies, but to act in a loving way towards them. Hence, forgiving them would be a way of acting in a loving way towards them. So agape love is related to a choice and commitment, not necessarily just being moved by feelings or emotions. Loving someone is to be like God towards someone, seeking his or her long term blessing and profit. Now, there are many biblical references to agape love. Matthew 5, 43, 44, love your enemies. Matthew 22, 36 to 40, great commandment, love God. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. John 13, 34, a new commandment, love one another. John 17, 26, love with which you love me may be in them. So that was Jesus talking to the father saying that the love you've loved me may be in them. He wanted us to have the love that G the father gave Jesus the son and to experience that love ourselves. And Romans 5, 5, the love of God was poured out within our hearts. Did we feel it? Did we experience it? Do we know it? And I think it's really important that we do. Therefore, if we've never had the love of God poured out in our hearts in an experiential way, even though it may be true, we can still subsequently experience it now. Romans 13, 10, love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13, 1 to 13, the greatest of these is love. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ controls us. Now, it doesn't mean it controls us and makes us do stuff, but it empowers us. It, it gives us the inspiration and motivation. Galatians 5, 6, faith working through love. Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the spirit is love. 1 John 4, 7, everyone who loves is born of God. So God expresses his character through restoring love, first love, to inspire us, to motivate us, to empower us to love him, ourselves and others. My friend Lindy, I was talking to her and Justin this week. We had a we had a, a day, sort of half a day where we were chatting and talking online um, she was talking and saying that God had been asking her how much she loved herself. And she sort of intimated that to start with, she would have felt uncomfortable with that. But now she realized the importance of that. Because if you do not love yourself, then you have not experienced God's love. And it's an important question for us to ponder. How much are we comfortable with loving ourselves? How do we think even think about that concept because some people struggle with that but god wants us to know his love to be able therefore to love ourselves because we know how loved and valuable and full of worth we are and from that place to be able to love others so it is an important thing to ask ourselves are we comfortable with the notion of being able to love ourselves so love is not just a virtue or a value or an ideal or a moral principle love is not just a feeling a sentiment an impulse or a passion love is not just romance benevolence or amicability love is the most powerful force in the whole of creation john 13 34 i am giving you a new commandment that you love one another now this next statement next part of this verse is the most important thing here just as i have loved you it is impossible to agape love somebody without having first really experienced god's love we may have emotions towards people we may even have self-sacrifice and be willing to do things for those people but when we know we are loved by God, we are empowered in a whole different dimension to love others. That you may also love one another. That is the key. That is why how the world will, will awaken to love when they feel 
and see others loving them and others each other the way God intends. So only God can express his character through love to us to inspire, motivate us to be able to love ourselves, others with agape. So love is not a psychological predisposition or a genetically produced social habit. And this is what you'll get if you look online. Uh, where does love come from and why, why, what is love in that sense? And there are all sorts of psychological answers to that. Agape love can only be expressed by us when derived from God. Love is the essence, nature and character of God experienced by us and then expressed through our lives. God's love has practical features to be expressed and demonstrated. Love is not defined by the act, but the character of God within the act. So you can do something which demonstrates love, but not necessarily be motivated to do that for the right reason or with God's heart within it. So true love precludes hypocrisy and play acting. You can't play at that. You can't pretend Love is unselfish, not based on self-need or want. We can't love someone with the intention that we will get them to love us back. That is not unconditional. So love is not conditional on repayment. Love doesn't care who gets the credit. Love is active, not merely passive or theoretical. Love precludes resentment, covetousness and judging one another. Love believes, trusts, and expects God to overcome all things by his love, because that's the promise. Agape love is primarily directed towards people, not things, ideas, doctrines, principles. We may have strong feelings for those things, but agape love is what we express towards people. Love of our neighbor desires them to have everything we have in our relationship with God and more. Love seeks to commend, not condemn. Love is not conditional on lovability or the actions of the recipient. Love builds others up, nurtures, edifies. It's constructive, not destructive. Love seeks the highest good of the other with no thought or of benefit to oneself. Love may involve self-denial, personal sacrifice and humility at times. Love is willing to suffer slights, hurts and rejection without retaliation. Love is the antidote to fear and paranoia and many of the deep problems that we may face psychologically in our lives. Love does not preclude confrontation or opposition or discipline. Hebrews 12, 6, God disciplines those he loves. And God will speak the truth in love. So love is not soft and wishy-washy. Love speaks the truth. There is, talks about tough love. Sometimes God will love us in the only way that is going to bring about change in our lives. And that might be feel like discipline. It might feel like what's happening to me? What's this? Why is this? What God does is often allow us to have the consequences of what we do to show us that we can move on from that and leave it behind. So love is not retaliatory. It turns the other cheek. Love prompts one to take the initiative to be the first to act, not to wait until someone does something to us. Love does not demand its personal rights. Love excludes suspicion and mistrust. Love is the fullest expression of God himself. Now, God's love for us contains all those ideals, words, concepts. He wants us to experience him love. He has parental love like a mother and father. He wants us to experience deep brotherly friendship. God's emotions has emotions and expresses them towards us so we can reciprocate with our own emotions and feelings. It isn't just emotions and feelings, but includes actually feeling and knowing emotionally that we are loved. Love is not weak. It's not just an emotion, but a powerful motivating force for good. Love is the very foundation and heart of the kingdom of God. Love is righteousness expressed. Love is the greatest practical expression of who God is. Love motivates whatever God does and is the essence of who he is. Love is to be experienced at all levels of who we are. 
Love is the vibrational frequency of God to be resonated with. Because when you resonate with a higher frequency, because love is the higher frequency of vibration we can experience, when we resonate with that, we will be entrained to come into alignment with that and vibrate at that frequency ourselves. So God wants us to experience that love. God's love for us. So God so loved not just the world, but you. And I think that is the most important thing to take. God so loved you that Jesus came, that we wouldn't be lost. So God's love was strong and powerful, and it was powerful enough to overcome the death that Jesus went into and took us into, because when he died, we were also died with him. When he went into the grave, we also were buried with him. But when he came up out of the grave in resurrection power, we also, as the whole of mankind, came up with him. His love is strong and powerful enough to bring us from death to life. And there's a, a verse which I love this verse, and it's a song that I like singing. Song of Solomon 8, 6. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as Sheol, the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. And I've experienced God's love in the fire of transformation, in the judgment seat of fire, on the altar of fire. You know, his love is passionate to consume anything in my life which is hindering me truly knowing who I am, knowing him in first love and experiencing that first love. Love is the strongest motivating force for good. Martin Luther King said this, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that and i think it's really really important that we embrace and experience that love for ourselves because he wants us to engage that love and ultimately i believe god is there for us to experience the amazing love that he has for us if we've been looking for love in the wrong places we can begin to turn towards the right place. If you've been searching for love, come to him and find that love. That is how he wants us to experience what first love really is. Because first love will enable us to experience acceptance, affirmation, approval, value and worth, esteem, recommendation commendation blessing endorsement and validation amongst many others i'm sure that is the song of eternal everlasting love that god has sung to you from before the foundation of the world he has been singing a love song and that love song has been a sound that's been calling you to come home I want to encourage you to embrace him where the beginning and the end meet in the midst of covenant love, infinite, unending love, where what was meets what is to reveal and release and birth what will be. And this is what first love does. It takes us back to the place of what was that will meet where we are right now and change it so that we will be able to come into something else the fullness of who God intends us to be. So to experience first love, first we need to abandon our soul into the trust of God who loves us unconditionally. We need to get out of the boat, that boat of survival, and sink into the vast ocean of unconditional love. So I want to finish there, but I want to just go into an activation. Let's have an opportunity of experiencing that encounter with God in love, going into unconditional love, but going further than that, because I believe God wants to, to begin to speak affirmation to us 
to begin to enable us to experience that reality. So I encourage you to close your eyes, come to a place of rest, begin to think of living loved, being loved in that first love way. Again, start to focus your breathing. Just begin to slow down, relax. Focus your thinking as you breathe slowly and breathe deeply. Thinking about God, who is love, who loves you. And as you breathe in slowly, you breathe in that unconditional love of the Father. You're breathing it into your very being. Every breath that you take is a life-giving force of energy, of love. That unconditional love, as you breathe it in, flows through your being. Start to feel it flowing through you. Breathe deeply. Be still as God releases that love in you, on you, through you. You are cocooned in unconditional love, filled to overflowing, unconditional love flowing through you as God demonstrates to you how much he loves you, how valuable you are to him. You are the apple of his eye, the treasure of his heart, the object of his desire. He calls you into union and oneness. He's calling you into this union of relationship. Just be filled with love. You're in the safest place you could be, surrounded by his love. Now, I just want you to picture that you're in the boat on that vast ocean of unconditional love. This is a choice to surrender the control of your soul that you can get out of the boat, abandon yourself, sink into that vast ocean of unconditional love. This is a choice. No one is forcing you to make this choice. If you want to go deeper, if you want to experience first love at another level, Just make that choice to step out of the boat and to sink. Sink deeper and deeper into love to experience restored first love, the calling, the wooing for you to go deeper.
so immersed in love. Hear the words of the Father speaking to you, calling you. Let these words resonate in your whole being. Son, I call your spirit to attention. Spirit, listen as a true son. Remember who you really are. I call forth your identity as a son, part of the Joshua generation, the order of Melchizedek. I call you to enter my rest. I call you to come deeper into intimacy. I call you to lie down in an oasis of peace, in this quiet brook of bliss, in this deep ocean of love. I call you to be willing to enter the dark cloud of transformation, the process of change. I call forth your sonship identity, your position and authority. I call forth your destiny to manifest God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I call forth your destiny to fill the earth with God's glory. I call forth your identity, destiny, authority as lords to administer God's rule on earth as it is in heaven. I call forth your identity and destiny authority as kings to have charge over God's heavenly courts. I call forth your identity and destiny and authority as sons to stand in my presence and be displayed on the earth. I call forth your identity, destiny and authority as sons of God to answer the groan of creation and restore it to original condition and purpose. I call forth the Joshua generation to rise up, take possession of their inheritance. You are my beloved sons and daughters in whom my soul delights. I am well pleased with you. I am well pleased with you. I am well pleased with you. Receive my acceptance. Receive my affirmation. Receive my approval. Receive my value and worth and esteem of you. Receive my recommendation, my commendation, my blessing, my endorsement and validation. I speak words of remembrance from my eternal heart to your spirit. I call you to come back to the origin of who you really are within that place of first love within my heart. I call you, come, come, come.
Stay in that place of intimacy and love, whatever God's doing with you. Just embrace it and I encourage you to pursue this in your own relationship with God. Just open up your heart and be willing to go wherever this leads to take the journey. Your journey will probably be different to mine, but it is a journey that all of us will go on if we want to come into that place of restoration in our own hearts and lives.